Hey, how's it going, everyone? Let me just check out all this working. Excellent. Today, I'm going to be talking about RubyAPI.org, which is an awesome website made by Colby Swandale. Uh, it's just fantastic documentation about Ruby and uh, it has a fantastic search engine and it's formatted so beautifully. <laughs> it's just an awesome website. The problem is that um, it uses Elasticsearch and I've just hammered the site, which is why these results are <laughs> a little bit off the, off the uh, chart, but um, it has some uh, latency issues, uh, primarily due to Elasticsearch just being slow. And uh, honestly, I don't know a lot about all the technologies that are being used, but um, Sorry, this is a little bit annoying because it's just, <laughs> I've just hammered the site completely and it's just gone bananas. Let's have a look at this uh, graph here. It'll probably give us a better idea of what's happening. 48 hours to 24 hours ago. Are you going to update? Well, I can't update that, but as you can see, the latency, if I just sit on top of one of those ones, 500 milliseconds, 600 milliseconds. And uh, there's been some PRs to try and fix this by adding caching and <clears throat> avoid memory allocations and much of other stuff in the Rails app, which is generating the content. Um, but one thing I added recently is... Uh, the ability to cache the pages. Uh, let's just have a quick look at that code. I think it's sitting in here, application controller. So any page that just says enable public cache will uh, skip sessions and expire the page in 30 minutes. So that is actually um, not doing any caching, but it's sort of specifying that we can do caching. And in particular, the page which is rendering the content has that set on it before action enable public cache. So if you look at a page like this, let's grab the URL curl i. Whoops. Make that a bit bigger. Maybe a little bit smaller. And you can see we get a cache control header um, of 30 minutes and public. But obviously this is not being cached. There's no cache built into Rails for this purpose as far as I'm aware. There's some rec middleware which can do it, rec-cache. And uh, actually what I found out recently is Nginx and Passenger both have internal caches. But the Passenger cache seems um, very specific to... Uh, Seems very specific to benchmarks because I think it has no matter what time you specify in the max age, it only caches for two minutes. Um, so it's not a particularly useful cache inside Passenger. But anyway, caching does make a lot of sense, especially if the content is static. There's no point hitting Elasticsearch over and over again and incurring those massive latencies. Uh, so I have some tooling to help understand what's going on, and I, it's called Benchmark. Let me just bring this up. It's a gem called benchmark-http and there's a mode called spider. And what is it? Spider's a site and it reports information about the timing of that spider. So if we run this against rubyapi.org, Twitter, okay. So what it's doing now is it's as quickly as possible hammering that site and basically downloading everything it can. Um, so it basically connects to that first page, it parses the HTML, extracts all the links, and then just fans out um, as many connections as it uh, can reasonably make to pull in that content as fast as possible. And what's pretty fascinating about this is um, Benchmark's HTTP Spider is not particularly optimized in terms of minimizing what it will try and pull down. 
and so the fragment identifier is considered a separate page. Um, so what's interesting is this tool is actually, at least in this case, quite useful for analyzing the uh, behavior of a cache because it's pulling down the same page several times. Um, so if we jump over to Heroku, uh, let's just go back to two hours and see what's going on. I, I just ran this earlier to see what would happen. And as you can see, it's just completely blown up. <laughs> it's pretty like funny. Um, not only did we uh, completely blow through uh, the memory, um, which I think seems like it's completely bombed out the server, or maybe there was, uh, yeah, I don't know what that is, um, but yeah. So normally we're running at about five, 460 megabytes. This is running Falcon, by the way, and we managed to get up to 1.1 gigabytes, which is pretty epic. So um, obviously it's caching a bunch of stuff, uh, and those caches are expanding, and uh, the processes are just growing to fill all available space. Um, so what do we have? That was 1,100 requests, but only 18 requests per second, which is pretty slow. So what Benchmark Spider told us, it took 1.1 minute to run, which is pretty quick, but what you might realize is here that it took 8,100 samples. So you probably can't see that, I'll just bump that up there a little bit. Uh, and only like 800 of them returned 200 okay, and 5,294 were 503 errors, i.e. the server just like wasn't responding, it was exploding. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what 420 is. Uh, standard deviation was 7.6 seconds, it's pretty bad. Uh, so anyway, like let's let's try and improve on this. And um, the way we're going to try and improve on this is by adding a layer of caching using Falcon. Uh, and I, honestly, I haven't even tried this before, so I don't know what it's going to be like in production. So it's kind of exciting for me uh, to try this out. So um, what I've got over here is I have a local instance of rubyapi.org. And what I'm going to do just for interest is I'm going to run an instance of Falcon. And I'm going to run an instance of Falcon. I'm going to run benchmark spider against their instance um, just to try and understand some baseline performance characteristics so let's just try that uh, okay <clears throat> and falcon runs over https by default and on this machine obviously uh, <clears throat> there are no memory limits no cpu limits so it will just um, consume as much as it needs <laughs> which is like oh well slack is using 23 gigabytes so you know <laughs> that's okay it's yeah a lot it's only 23 gigabytes of virtual memory um where is falcon so it's sitting there, it's using about a gigabyte of memory one process, and it's 1.2 1, 1 gigabytes of virtual memory. It's only using 275 megabytes of virtual <coughs> uh, private memory. And it's basically just saturating one CPU core as you'd expect. I actually, I don't know how much um, internally is being cached. Uh, obviously Rails has fragment caching and other forms of caching, but I actually don't know. Um, if that's, you know, to, to me, like local caches are a big problem in the sense that you will need to eventually restart this process because it will, the cache, will, unless you have a cache eviction strategy, then the cache will just keep on growing. And I guess I don't need to explain why that's a problem. Um, but anyway, let's see how the spider process is going. Now, there's one other thing which is kind of interesting. Oh, I don't want to kill that. What am I doing? Did I just kill the process of spidering? Oh, come on. Okay, I did not mean to kill that process. We'll start that off again. And in the meantime, we'll do some other stuff. Die. Restart. Uh, the spider keeps on going. Okay, <laughs> we'll just the numbers will be a bit skewed, but it won't matter too much. 
Um, right, so uh, let's have a look at one other test tool, which is kind of fun, which is part of this gem, which is the uh, concurrency detection. And what concurrency detection tries to do is figure out um, how many requests it can make before your service starts basically slowing down. And what I mean by that is if you have an eight core CPU and you're running a web server with eight processors, your theoretical concurrency is eight, right? If you issue nine requests, one of them is going to block until the first, like, until one CPU core frees up. Now, of course, it's not, that's a very simplified um, explanation, but this is what this tool tries to figure out. <clears throat> So what it does is it does a binary search of um, requests asynchronous. So it spins up like, you know, in this case, it's spinning up like two separate tasks and each task is running requests against that server. This is the rubyapi.org running on Heroku that we're testing right now. We've got another test over there running a localhost. And what it essentially does is it looks at uh, how many concurrent connections can it make before that server starts slowing down. It's, it's not strictly accurate because, of course, you need to consider network latency and all these other like facets which affect concurrency and throughput. But it is quite a useful um, tool just to kind of understand the nature of how your server is impacted by the uh, increasing number of users. So let's have a look. So you can see it started off with like one task and it was 150, uh, sorry, 757 milliseconds. And we increased to two tasks, went to 762, four tasks, 770, eight tasks, 766. So it was increasing slightly and it will keep on going, doing this binary search um, until it finds uh, the threshold is set to 1.2, which means it will accept up to a 20% slowdown. Now you can obviously tighten that if you want, um, but it's really just looking at uh, how the requests slow down up to 20% in this case, as you increase the number of simultaneous users. So let's jump in, it's still running. I think that should finish soon. Remember, these numbers are going to be a bit skewed because we like blew the server, <laughs> we like trashed the server like halfway through the benchmark. Uh, it'll be okay. So what's interesting is you see that the network latency is um, so significant that the number of concurrent requests, obviously Falcon is fully concurrent, uh, but Heroku uses an Erlang uh, application proxy, like a load balancer. And that plus Falcon need to work together, obviously, to you know maximize or, or I guess minimize the latency as, as the number of concurrent users uh, increases. But this is such a huge baseline concurrency that uh, any concurrency within the Heroku network is going to be uh, marginal in comparison. Like my network latency is huge, um, but that that's just part of it, you know. Like when you're looking at these kinds of things, you're considering. Um, how the network latency plus the server latency, all of those are factors. Right, so let's have a look uh, over here. It finished. It took 4,800 samples. They were all okay. The standard deviation was 10 seconds, 14 requests per second. I feel like that was a little bit um, slower than some previous benchmarks. Was I running with the cache or not? I can't even remember. So that was without the cache, actually. Okay, so... 49 requests per second. So Falcon, uh, Falcon servers for development purposes, but you can enable the cache just by doing this. And the cache um, is implemented by async HTTP cache. It's middleware that sits inside async HTTP on the server side or even the client side, you can use it in either place. And it just uses a memory store at the moment, although there's plans to um, implement a Redis uh, cache. And the benefit of re using a Redis cache is that you can use uh, least recently used case eviction, cache eviction provided by Redis, uh, which is really awesome. And you can share the cache between, you know, however many servers you have, whereas with the in-memory cache is going to be obviously consuming memory on each individual process, which is 
you know, frankly pretty stupid, I guess. Um, but you know, this was a quick and dirty hack to try and make something work, and uh, I'm happy with it for this purpose. So, <clears throat> uh, what have I done, Pierce? Uh, why can I not bind that pawn? Uh, okay, this one is still running. Let's get rid of that. Spin up Falcon. So Falcon is running now with the cash. So I'm not so concerned with the number of samples benchmark spider takes because we obviously we trashed the server halfway through, which is a bit of a nightmare. Um, what I'm more concerned with is the request per second, which shouldn't be significantly affected by that, and also the standard deviation, which in this case is huge. Like 10 seconds is massive. It's bananas. So the critical thing is um, this cache is not hot. Uh, it is um, starting off cold. And so as we spider these, um, you'll see individual uh, pages that share the same URL. Obviously, the we hope that the fragment identifier is uh, not part of the cache key, as we, you know, I mean, you expect that which is <laughs> because I implemented it, hopefully that's working. Um, and in essence, we're requesting the same page over and over again. So like, if there's a cache, it, it, it should be kicking in and helping out. Right, let's jump over here and have a look. So these are the instances where I completely trashed um, with Benchmark Spider. Colby has very generously given me access to the Heroku dashboard so I can play around with um, a real production system. Um, and it's just really fantastic to have access to that and have real real traffic hitting Falcon and, and being able to experiment with stuff like caching. <laughs> Max 217%. That's awesome. So Falcon, uh, sorry, Benchmark HTTP concurrency uses um, standard deviation and standard error to try, uh, try and reduce the standard error to within an uh, acceptable tolerance. So it's just going to run as many requests as it needs to feel confident in the results that it's generating. Um, but yeah, very, very uh, network specific. You know, even changing conditions on the network can affect uh, how confident it is and the results that it's generating so that's why this one is probably taking a long time excuse me <clears throat> one of the tricky things about HTTP caching which I, I didn't really consider is um, so obviously we have uh, let's have a quick look at the cache works so the cache is a middleware and it sits uh, in front of the server, essentially. Um, when you run Falcon with dash dash cache, it just basically sits this middleware right in front of your web application. And essentially what it does is it um, generates a key, cache key from the request. So the cache key in this case is the host name, the method, and the path. And I didn't know anything about this, but... Um, there's actually a really great, I was looking at how fastly it implements their caches and what they're doing. They actually have this process of request normalization. And what request normalization is, is <clears throat> it's possible that um, your request is gonna provide things like I accept gzip or not gzip or I accept uh, languages, English, French, German, Japanese, whatever. And every permutation of those uh, keys uh, needs to be considered in the cache key computation because if you request a page and you say, I prefer um, French at, you know, uh, one QEQ is 1.2 and German 1.7 and English, you might get back a French page. But if you... Um, 
if you change your priority even if you change your priority like french 1.1 the server may choose something different. I mean, in theory, there's standard ways to resolve that, but um, if you make a request and you say, I accept the following languages and you get a response back and the cache is trying to figure out how do I cache this response? Here was the request, here was the response. Then <clears throat> obviously you need to take those uh, request headers and factor that into the kind of response you got. And so, um, that is a very tricky thing and the prop the reason why it's tricky is because every permutation of uh header you know like french q equals 1.1 french q equals 1.2 french q equals 1.3 french q equals 1.31 every single permutation of those headers potentially generates like a different response although in practice it doesn't and so there's this process of normalization where you try and take those keys and you distill them down into the actual values that will determine the response content and so in this case um, accept encoding is really simple it turns out that lots of web browsers uh, provide a different organization or format of their accept encoding header but it basically boils down to do you accept gzip or don't you there's really just two options there so this process of normalization takes all of the accept encoding headers it just turns it into one of those two options. Um, it's that, that means that you really only have two permutations to, to consider. Uh, so that time we were a bit more successful and we had 80 requests per second and the standard deviation was 5.7 seconds. So it's a significant improvement. Uh, and I've seen it improve more than that, but you know, this is the real world. We're testing real sites and real, um, real scenarios. So like, I'm not too concerned with this variability in there, but it, it is better. So what I want to do now is um, I'm sick of waiting for that to finish. <laughs> okay, let's um, go in and update uh, the Heroku configuration to use the cache. Let's push it out and let's see if it actually makes any kind of improvement at all or maybe it just totally destroys the site like who knows <laughs> it's exciting right i mean anything could happen uh where has my atom code gone i have some questions hello thank you very much for your great work you're doing around ruby ecosystem i started using bake by the way in one of my projects i really like it so much simpler than rack awesome <clears throat> Yeah, I think Bake is um, kind of, Rake has been around for so long and has kind of, uh, it has a very like, a lot of baggage. And so, you know, I, I don't really mind that. I think like Rake has a lot, lot going for it, but it, it solves a lot of problems that people don't really care about anymore. And that's, that's not a criticism. It's just like the nature of like changing requirements. So when I built Bake, I was just like, what problems do I want to solve? And like, what are the most important bits? And for me, it's just like running tasks and converting arguments um, <clears throat> and being able to do that quickly. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel like that makes a lot of sense. You mentioned in one of your tweets, if I want to write complex multi-thread code, Ruby is not the tool I reached for. Which language would you use for multi-threaded code? Oh, that's such a complicated question. <laughs> uh, um, the worst possible answer I can give is I would reach for C++ just because um, the tooling for C++ is amazing uh, and in particular the tooling around multi-threaded C++ is pretty damn good and stable. Um, so things like the address sanitizer, the undefined behavior sanitizer, uh, performance profilers, debuggers, they're, they're all pretty like complicated to use, but they're really just solid tools and it just makes um, life so much easier. If you were asking me from a theoretical point of view, like what I would use, it would be... Um, there is so much fantastic research being done about how to build code which 
cannot be thread unsafe. So I don't know if Rust is strictly in this category, but um, what is it, Clojure? I've never used Clojure, but I've read about it with admiration because um, they basically uh, don't allow you to do unsafe operations in the language. So there are languages actually that, that try to solve those problems and Ruby is not one of them. Um, and C++ is definitely not one of them, but it has the tooling to make it fe feasible. Um, yeah, and I guess the other language I really, really like is Haskell because Haskell um, encodes in its semantics uh, the various models of computation regarding like, you know, sequential operations and how those operations change state. And what I like about that is the type system of Haskell is powerful enough to uh, describe the nature of a function, not just like the inputs and the outputs, but the kind of computation that it does. And um, that can encode things like whether a function is, uh, I guess, you know, very, very simply, like, you know, not really going into detail, like whether that function is thread safe or not. Um, so there are a ton of stuff out there and, and Ruby is just not a language that prov provides the constructs uh, to protect people from those kinds of mistakes. So I, I don't know, like I really like Ruby, um, but it's just not, uh, it, it's great for, it's, it, it's a really great language for just expressing your ideas, but it's not, Part of that is like when you go to Haskell and you want to express your ideas, you run up into all the limitations and uh, limitations is the wrong word, like all the um, the semantic modeling that Haskell imposes on your code is just so frustrating sometimes. And you want to write something and you can't write it. And so I just I really love with Ruby you can just literally like uh, <laughs> yeah you know you can. Just throw your ideas and down to a text editor and have that work. Um, anyway, what am I doing here? Good. Why am I on this branch? So we're just gonna go ahead and update Heroku. Uh, so I've been working on some stuff and there's some updates. Double check out of everything. Bundle update, taking its sweet time. Maybe it could do with some improvements to concurrency. <laughs> uh, great, so we will update the dependencies. And I'm not coming to that file, I'm coming to that file. And hopefully there's some CI because I'm not testing anything. And we're adding dash dash cache. Now, I've this, this is not something I test in advance. I have no idea if this is going to make any difference at all. I'm just like, the whole point of this video was to be like, yes, it makes a difference. But I actually, um, so you know, it's more exciting, I guess. Right, Heroku, maybe this one, connected to a pipeline, activity feed, and now I guess we just wait for that to do something. What do we do in the meantime? Is this thing over here finished? So it's probably never going to finish, um, probably because the tolerance is too high and the network is just too unreliable. So if it's making asynchronous requests and the network latency is jumping all over the place, it will not narrow down to a point where this tool is happy with the results. Um, 
like it will in theory eventually if you run it like for hours uh, but there are a couple of options which you can do to sorry I can, it's kind of annoying having the lines wrap in but anyway let's try running it with a slightly lower confidence maybe 0 0.96 I guess ideally what you would expect this tool to find is uh, excluding network latency. You'd expect it to um, <clears throat> report four because we actually have four instances of Falcon running. Now Falcon itself internally uh, if you increase the number of requests from one to two, the latency will increase. If you have one instance of Falcon and you make one request to it, that request is gonna take some specific amount of time. But if you make uh, two requests, even though Falcon is concurrent, that request will still take slightly longer. So um, what you'd expect is this tool would report essentially the concurrency of your setup. Uh, but in this case, because the network latency is so high, you're not just looking at the latency of the tooling, but also the, every single hop between you and, and the system. I love how this has just gone completely bananas. <laughs> Memory quota exceeded. Uh, it's awesome. This has never had so many requests. <clears throat> I think the problem with traditional benchmarking tools is they tell you a number and you don't really know what it means. Um, request per second uh, doesn't tell you what's going to happen when you double your number of users. And that's kind of... Uh, more important actually than just raw throughput. Did I push? Is it deploying? What's happening? GitHub connected. Yes, it did four minutes ago. I think Heroku has done a really good job on their um, whole platform, but I'm not convinced their statistics are on point. In particular, this memory usage just seems totally wrong to me um, based on my experience. Uh, okay, this is finished. So <clears throat> let's have a look at like what was actually reported. I mean, this would be nice when you read it. So we started off as you'd expect at one request and we made 11 requests in 11.5 seconds. The per request latency was one second. That is about one asynchronous request per second. The variance was pretty tight. That's a good sign. Standard deviation was 30 milliseconds. It's not bad. I made two asynchronous tasks, so each make sequential requests. I made 22 requests in 11.9 seconds. So you see as we doubled the number of connections, we essentially doubled the number of requests in the same duration. So we could make almost two requests per second, but it wasn't quite two requests per second. It wasn't quite twice that much. You know, even then it started to come down. And so now we've gone four connections, and we haven't quite gone up to four requests per second. You can see it's kind of curving down a little bit uh, in terms of like if you know if this was if we literally had um, four unimpeded connections you would expect four times this number eight connections uh, I made 88 requests in 12 seconds the per request latency was 1.1 second which is actually pretty huge uh, frankly speaking that's 7.28 
asynchronous request per second, the variance is starting to increase, standard deviation is starting to get pretty big. <clears throat> uh, 16 asynchronous tasks at 16 connections to Heroku, made 176 requests in 13.4 seconds. The per request latency was 1.2 seconds, that's 13 asynchronous requests per second. So we got to 32, <clears throat> and so I made 352 requests in 15 seconds. So the per request latency went to 1.4 seconds, and the original latency was 1.0 seconds, and the previous latency was 1.2 seconds, so it was 20% allowable, so this was okay. So it decided to go one more, you know, one more doubling of binary search, and uh, 1.4 seconds is beyond that 20% allowance. So what it's done is it's it's gone okay. Well, somewhere between 16 and 32, so now it's done 24, and it's found that it's 1.3. Now why has that gone up again? Uh, did we change? No, the lunch room. Uh, I have no idea what's going on there. But anyway, let's come back to this one and have a look at what it reported. So I'm running, so I did a little binary search, got 2625. I made 275 requests in 14 seconds. The per request latency was 1.3. That's 19.65 requests per second. Um, <clears throat> your server can handle 24 concurrent requests. At this level of concurrency, requests have about 1.2% higher latency. So yeah, um, that is that is really the key point. Uh, so beyond 24 concurrent requests, your server, or in this case, a rubyapi.org starts slowing down by more than 20% for all those individual connections. And that, that's kind of the key point. Um, this, this tool is trying to determine specifically what point that occurs at. So let's jump over here and have a look. Has this deployed yet? Maybe. That kind of looks like a deployment. Okay, there we go. Right, so I guess the key is gonna be whether that site starts to respond a bit better. Now, of course, async HTTP cache is using an in-memory cache which means all four servers have their own in-memory cache. So we could probably blow the memory usage pretty quick if that cache is huge. I actually don't know, we're gonna find out. And also, um, the cache will take a while to warm up. So we may not see results right away, but I guess the key point is, um, you know, in theory, we should see some improvement. Actually, we could just hit a single page and have a look at like how it behaves. So let's take this one and let's just hit it with like work and see what happens. I mean, I should have done this before I enabled caching, but like at least we'll see if it's bad or not. Latency, average 639 milliseconds, standard deviation, max one point, it's pretty bad. Still, let's try running it again, see if it improves or not. Might just be a while for the cache to warm up, or maybe it's just not working for, uh, you know, who knows. Seems a little bit better. 22 requests per second instead of 15. latency is definitely a bit a bit better average latency has come down almost uh 30 percent which is quite good i mean i think um <clears throat> my connection to the server is going from new zealand to the united states so i think the latency is already quite high okay i'm wrong <laughs> it's is like low that can't be right is it hosted in new zealand no i don't believe that You know what? I think there's cloud for it, cloud flare in front of it. In which case, maybe this is all for naught. But anyway, what I want to do next is I want to run um, 
internally between the Erlang load balancer and Falcon, uh, having a cache should mean that the servers don't get completely overloaded. Uh, so let's try running benchmark spider against it again and see what happens. Where, oh, there it was. So I ran this before and I think it took like 10 minutes. Which is <laughs> quite, you know, this what, it took 10 minutes to run it against the production system on Heroku. Running it locally only takes a few minutes. But, um, and those, uh, those errors that are being reported, they are due to invalid HTML um, because I'm parsing the HTML using Trini parser and the HTML is actually wrong. Uh, so you can see like there's angle brackets inside this code tag and it turns out to be actually a bug with RDoc, which no one knew about and I just reported. <laughs> there's like a Ruby issue, there's an issue on GitHub about it now. Uh, anyway, so let's have a look. Um, is the server being trashed? Like what What happens? Cause like before, this is, this is what happened when I ran it before with no cache. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens now, whether we see any tangible benefit. So far, the, if you look at like this one, we were handling like, 20 requests per second which is like horrendously slow in my opinion and now we're managing 73 requests per second which is not too bad and i guess the red one here is like the danger zone 290 requests per second were failing and it looks like none of the requests are failing at the moment uh which is a pretty good sign so what that means is the cache is um relieving the server the rails app of its internal performance issues uh, when you have a rails app which is processing requests and falcon is firing requests at it ultimately if that app is slow the request will eventually fail uh, there are various reasons why that can happen um, i assume that Like a typical example would be um, you are waiting for a database adapter and Rails has a default time out of like five seconds. So if you have uh, all your database uh, connections are used up, then another request comes in, you're gonna have problems. If, the, you know, after five seconds, it will just time out and fail. But I, I, I'm liking this, like so far it looks pretty, pretty good. Like it looks like a pretty big improvement you know, went from handling like, you know, 15 or 20 requests per second, which is pretty junky, up to sort of like 70, 111 requests per second. Uh, let's have a look at what's going on here. 30 second response time, that's bad. I've actually seen that before. I wonder if that's actually a timeout in Elastic Cache. And the cache is obviously chewing through memory. But that's okay, I don't really care about that. Because we are hammering the server. It's kind of to be expected. Okay, we have a couple of failed requests. 192 requests have failed. What errors are being reported? Memory quota app crashed. Did it actually crash? Connection closed without response. Memory quota exceeded. Memory quota vastly exceeded. Vastly exceeded. <laughs> this like cost extra money. I 
I'm still I'm still really happy with this. Like if you compare the two previous instances of running benchmark spider, uh, benchmark HTTP spider. I mean, these are just disastrous results, really. And this is looking like pretty solid to me. Um, so the key point will be like, I guess I'll. Oh, it's killed an instance. That's okay. Probably because it used too much memory. That's probably why it reported as being crashed. I don't know. Um, what I'm interested in is now to leave this running over a couple of days and have a look at how the latency has impacted. Because the latency before, as I said, was like there were instances of like, um, I wonder if I can just do this. So this is what the latency normally looks like for the application. So like, this is, my understanding is this is Elastic Cache just doing its thing. 500 milliseconds, 479. And it's not like there's a huge number of requests being processed. It's like one less than one request per second. This, you know, during this period of time, the site is pretty damn quiet. Um, so my, my goal is uh, hopefully by enabling this cache, you know, all of those pages like string and I mean, probably enable the cache for like eight hours or something. You know, you probably set the time out instead of 30 minutes, have it set to like eight hours. So the stuff is just staying cached for ages. Um, round off like all of these numbers because yeah 500 milliseconds is pretty slow uh, in my opinion comparison of array with array failed fantastic <laughs> this is like what I wanted Oh, well, I think that's where I leave you. Um, I think this will be an interesting experiment to see how this plays out. I'm really happy with those results. Um, you know, being the site's absolutely been hammered. Uh, 7.1 thousand requests in that one minute period. Oh, there we go. Something bad happened. I don't know what that means. More investigation required. But anyway, I'm I'm happy, like it seems to have helped. And for a version 0.1, it's uh it's pretty decent. So we'll see how we go from there. Excellent, thank you very much everyone. And uh let me check the chat. Uh don't forget the interwebs is running like trash at the moment. Oh yeah, that's true. Why is the variance so high? I mean, is it normal in Ruby? It's normal with HTTPS from New Zealand, I see. Yes, it is. New Zealand internet uh, is pretty crap, especially the United States. I just think it was a setup meter. Uh, uh. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad you all enjoyed it and it went on for longer than I imagined. Um, and I, I'll probably give an update, you know, uh, in a while and see what potentially happens. I mean, that looks bad to me. I don't know what happened there, whether that's like a sign of a problem uh, or whether um, something disaster has happened in Benchmark Spider. But like that part there looks fantastic to me. So, but that part looks bad. <laughs> so, you know, well, there we go. It's, it's uh, pre-production, in-production, whatever. Excellent. <laughs>